It's always a pleasure to come back at Ruby Ruby Day for me. I have a strong connection with the, with this conference, of course, because I'm Italian. And to me, Ruby Day is kind of a Christmas, uh, that where I see old faces that I don't see for one year, and then we come here and hug ourselves and uh, cheers, and then uh, another year passes. So thank you, Grusp, to taking the chance to make Christmas to happen this, uh, this year as well. I've lost my control here, just another technical problem, but we will get over. So, uh, last time I was, uh, was here, that was actually not last year, but uh, a few years ago, um, Hanami was still named Lotus for uh, those who didn't know about this. So we have a, a lot of things to talk about and also to have a look at the, the future. But before doing that, let me introduce myself. I'm Luca Guidi. I'm the author of Anami, which is an open source project. Um, specifically, it's a web stack, uh, full stack uh, web framework for, um, for Ruby. I work remotely from uh, uh, Rome, Italy for a company named DNS Simple, and we do domain registrations, DNS, SSL certificates, and everything can be automated via an API, which is written by uh, Hanami. This is, Hanami has been battle tested with this uh, API. So if you look to build your infrastructure automation, you should really check it out, uh, the result of the Hanami effort here. I've got stickers and t-shirts, so make sure to say hi again and uh, uh, we will discuss about uh, everything about Ruby and about um, Hanami. So, just a quick digression about the Hanami 1.0. Lotus was renamed, eventually renamed into, into Hanami due to copyright issues, and there was a um, few months later, I released 1.0. There was a strong demand for 1.0 because people wanted to know if Hanami was stable and production ready. And it was. We were using, again, for a long time at DNS Simple, there were another bunch of companies uh, doing, uh, doing the same. And I understand this kind of concern from people because Hanami is a kind of uh, open source project that is not in a corner of your you know, product, but it's something that demands how code is written, both at the architecture level and uh, at, the level, at the micro level, that means in terms of classes, how they are structured. So people want to know if uh, the design was stable enough to be, you know, to, for companies to invest on, uh, on it. So I want to send a strong signal to the, to the community and say, okay, uh, enough testing, this is no longer an experiment. This is something that we use it to build something where money is involved. You can do the same, okay? So I released the 1.0, but I wasn't 100% happy about the design. And I think this is natural because this is something that happens with all creative work. Um, filmmakers, writers, they always won't postpone the release date until the product is perfect, right? But that level of perfection never happens because our mind is faster than the software, right? We have a lot of ideas, but just a few of them are worth to be introduced in the software and then gets through the process of implementation, testing, and so on. So again, uh, I had this kind of chicken egg problem where I wanted to organically evolve the software below 1.0 because Below 1.0, everything is easy. You can have breaking changes, but people refused to adopt Hanami because it was one, um, below 1.0. So releasing 1.0 was the best decision ever because I had to stop and say, enough, let's move to the, to the next chapter uh, of, uh, of, this, um, of this project. And again, doing that, Make, taking that decision was also good because uh, being all by myself and with the, with the other few people of the, of the team, we get only a narrowed vision of what's important for us as developers, but with 1.0 and a lot of feedback that we gathered from the community, we had the chance to uh, leverage on uh, this kind of collective intelligence to see through thousands eyes uh, things that we never discovered about the software that we 
uh, we're building. So it's a paradox, but it's better to share. And I know uh, that you agree because we, uh, we are all involved in, um, in open source. Again, we had um, a lot of feedback, uh, positive feedback. We had 30% uh, in a growth in adoption rate just uh, last year. So with all that amount of feedback, uh, we decided to um, understand the good parts of 1.0, continue maintaining it, but also to um, shape uh, the software following new principles alongside with, uh, with new ones. And today I want to talk about those principles, not about the shape of code that you will see, because this is still in, um, still in the making, um, but I want the community to understand first what are the intentions behind 2.0, rather than see directly the software. Because the software, seeing directly the software may lead to a lot of questions that I want to answer today, okay, and then uh, share the code when, when it's finished. Okay, so this is uh, an high level perspective of what Hanami 2.0 will, uh, will look like. Again, we want to keep all the same features but reshape them. Okay, we think that Hanami is good enough to build web applications, it's just a matter of changing. Uh, how um, some components are structured following the principles that we, we are going to see today. Um, the existing principles like strong OP, testability, ease of use, productivity are here to stay. They are not going to be to replace, they are only, they were the principle that drew, um, that driven the um, software development is the day zero of Lotus and then Anami, so they are here to stay. We want just to add more values to our, uh, to our uh, framework. First thing first, simplification. This is based on feedback that we had in chat, over the forum, and so on. Um, Hanami on one end is optimized for productivity. Here is a strong and really good uh, CLI that I'm proud of. It has code generators that includes code, unit tests, integration tests. They expose details to you, so it's easy to reason about. It's easy to unit test to create in, um, integration tests. But on the other hand, Hanami had uh, what you see is what you get approach. What that means? That means that by typing Hanami new Instagram, for instance, let's take, let take this example, there is uh, generated for you a bunch of settings. Why is that? Because I wanted you to guess nothing about the project. You see the settings, you have not to, to guess what your application is going to do. Everything is there for you. And it's documented, so you have to read through the settings and that's it. So I wanted it to be extremely explicit, okay? So we have settings for the general Instagram project. Alongside with that, for those who don't know, Hanami uh, can hold inside the same uh, Ruby process several silos of your, uh, of your product. Um, in this example, we have a silo, which is a, a standalone application named web for the front-end UI, then you have the admin panel, then you have the API, uh, because y uh, we believe in a um, monolith-first approach. That means there is nothing faster for your product for the first three years, five years of uh, work to iterate in the same code base and having just one um, thing to deploy across your servers. Microservices are something cool, but there is no time to invest in that in the first couple of years because you're, you are optimizing something that you don't know if needs to be scaled. So our approach is to have everything in the same code base, but there is a distinction. There are those strong boundaries inside uh, the part of your, of your application. Why I'm telling you this? Because each of those applications that are living in the inside of these apps um, directory have their own customizable, customiz um, customizable settings. It means sessions, cookies, assets, behavior, content, security policy, whatever. Everything can be customized per each 
silo of your application per each app that we have just seen. We had three apps in this Instagram example. You, are going, you can have three configuration files where to set up this, uh, this thing. And alongside with that, you mount those applications inside the, the main router. So it's a bunch of stuff. I recognize my mistake here because this was overwhelming for newcomers. Again, this behavior was intended to help you in simplification. That means you have to not guess what the software is going to do, but in the end, people got overwhelmed. Typing an Ami new Instagram, people get, whoa, what is this? Okay? It was too much stuff in, um, to reason about because developers try to parse every setting because if the framework generated that, then it's important for me. So I have to reason about this setting, this other setting, this other setting, and so on. That was too much. So the principle of simplification is that Hanami 2.0 unifies all the settings in just one place, and the amount of generated code is this. Okay, so it's the opposite way around. There would be just a few settings here, but you got the point. It's not explicit like in the past. It would be, everything would be have a default in the framework, well documented, but you are going only to set here, in this file, the settings that you need to change. You want a different content security policy um, way of work for your app, but you are just going to customize that specific setting. So newcomers don't get confused by that, by the amount of settings that we, uh, we have. And that, in general, this is just an example of simplification that we, you will see in uh, Hanami 2.0. We are trying to reduce the verbosity, uh, and settings are a source of verbosity. And this approach also leads to uh, performance gain in general, but for this specific example that I pulled in, uh, in terms of the HTTP routing, because in the past, this is a NAMI 1.0, you see those three apps are standalone rack-compatible apps mounted. They hold a, a router inside of it, and they are all mounted inside a general uh, router. That means a router to switch between those three apps and another router inside of those three applications. So we had at least two router to touch. Hanami 2.0 will simplify by simplification by putting everything together. There is just one router, which is, of course, much, much faster. The second principle is just a little bit hard to wrap uh, our heads around, but I try to do my best. This is the blending of functional programming and OOP programming. Bear with me for five minutes, and you will see there is nothing to be scared of. We have been exposed to functional programming languages in the la la past years, mainly because of Elixir. A lot of um, Ruby developers migrated over that, uh, that community, and we have to recognize, uh, acknowledge the powerful features that those languages bring to your day-by-day -day, uh, work. But at the same time, we are here at Ruby Day, so we want to use Ruby at the end of the day, but still we can take inspiration of what those uh, functional languages can teach to us. Lucky enough, we are lucky enough to say that Ruby is a multi-paradigm language. We used to refer to it as an object-oriented programming language, but nothing prevents us to uh, write Procedural code, FP code, it's a bit of a stretch to write FP code, but still it's possible. So the point, main point here is to take advantage of existing basic simple features that Ruby exposes to take FP inspiration, apply to OOP to write better OP, where better is something that we are going to define now. Okay? The first principle I call it pipelines. We have been, we use it to refer and think about the main structure of web applications with MVC. Okay? Now, the problem with MVC is this. Okay? 
we have the V. We know how to write views. We have the controller we can reason about. And then this is MVC. We are left by ourselves writing the most complex part of our application. The M part, which stands for model, includes business logic, entities, repositories, database, persistence, callback, uh, preconditions, postconditions, validations, notifications, you name it, okay? So the point is that uh, the role of a, web, of, a, of a web framework is to give you an exact direction on where to put all the steps of your features. So again, Let's get back to our Instagram example. Instagram is defined by a set of features. That means sign in, sign up, upload a picture, whatever, leave a command, and so on. If you think about uh, your application, not in terms of MVC, but in terms of vert vertical slices, vertical uh, jobs to be done, vertical tasks that your application application offers, then you can consider it a kind of algorithm. It goes from user interface to database and the way back, okay? So forget for a second about MVC. Each feature is a pipeline of steps, okay? And each step has only one responsibility. Each step takes an input, it transform, transforms that, elaborates that input, returns an output, it's a small algorithm and passes that output as the input to the next step. Browser sends the payload to the router that transforms into params, pass it to the action, validator, repository, action, packages all the data to the view, to the template, which returns HTML back to the browser, right? This is too much for a slide, but I guess all of you are familiar with this, okay? Single steps for a single feature to be done, okay? Again, each step has a clear defined goal. Next principle. If we implement each step as a single purpose object, then that satisfies a single responsibility principle. And look at the beauty of this. We started from talking about Elixir and functional programming languages, and now we are satisfying one of the pillars of OOP. That means co starting considering our features as a steps, as jobs to be done. Each job to be done has a single step that can be implemented by a single object. Okay? The equivalent of in uh, functional programming are small functions. Okay? They only do one thing, but the beauty of it, they can be composed together to, do, to write more complex programming. Think of those objects like Lego bricks. You can build a Millennium Falcon, you can bring, I don't know, Harry Potter castle, whatever, but everything starts with a single set of identical compatible objects. They, they are atomic to us, but they, we can combine together and build whatever uh, you want. But again, it starts from the same set of bricks. That means reusability in, in OOP terms. Now, those objects uh, are uh, needs to be to, to talk each other, right? Because they again, they are. The, in the same pipeline. So like Lego bricks, you are sure that if you buy a bunch of Lego bricks from one shop and from another shop, you are sure that you can use them because compatibility is a key features, feature for Lego, for Lego success. So we have to agree in a certain way on how those small objects to, uh, work together. Think of Unix. We have LS, Grep, AWK, all the small programs that they do just one task and they have the concept of input and output and there is the concept of the pipeline using those small tools, we can have more and more complex program to achieve what we need. Getting back to our community, leaving Unix, getting back to Ruby, for instance, we have an excellent example that this year turned uh, 10 years. RAC unified the entire web development community 
uh, on one hand we have web framework and the frameworks and on the other hand we have web servers and they can talk each other just having one single method which accepts a an hash and returns an array. Look at the beauty and the simplicity of this. We unified an entire community just with one method. And that method is call. Why specifically that one? Because Ruby encourages the user usage of call. Um, a proc responds to call, a method referenced by name responds to call, and by the same extent, I suggest to uh, expose a call as an entry point for your input. Now, I don't know if you can read properly, but if you look at the left side before the dot, we have different objects, but we don't care about that. We care they respond to, they duck that way. So again, we are starting from FP and we are ending to uh, talking about duck typing. I don't care about what your object is, as long it exposes call to accept an input and return an output, then can be part of this pipeline, okay? I call them callable objects. What is a callable object? This is a callable object. Okay, a task to be done, upload the file, there is no error man management, sorry, it can fail, the network can fail, but it's for the sake of simplicity, you have just one task to be done, it exposes call to do, the, to do the job. And again, this is deadly simple, you have to not reason about what is, uh, this is uh, doing, and again, this can be reusable. And by the same extent, why I'm telling you this? Because dynamic components will respond to call. So again, we want to provide a set of pillars where to build your features, because along the line you can map and use Hanami objects to build the pipeline. Again, from the browser to the database and the way back. Okay? Now, there is just one a couple of missing pieces to the picture here. Um, one of these is dependency injection. That for me is extremely important. I consider OOP as the art of arranging dependencies, okay? Um, because that are, uh, at the end of the day, the way you structure your application and the way you maintain it, it's based on the dependency graph that you uh, have inside your uh, your application. So I always encourage to use dependency injection. So we refactored our uploader and now it passes the dependency through the initializer. With Ruby we are lucky enough that dependency injection means only to pass a param to the initialize. Why that is important? For two reasons. If you are reading code, okay, and we read code more than we write, you have guessed you have to take out of the question the, um, uh, to guess what are the dependency for a specific file, uh, for a specific object, sorry. You have to look at the initialize method, okay? So it's just a rule of thumb to, to get over the dependency, dependency graph. Okay, it depends on this storage client, okay? And the second reason, those are practical reasons, are testability, to write proper unit tests, avoiding to um, to upload the file for real during, uh, during the test. So those are practical properties and practical tips on why to use dependency injection. And as a rule of thumb, always remember, use initialize for dependencies and call for input. Now, to make these objects even more maintainable, maintainable, we want them to be deterministic. What that means? That means for a given input, I always observe as a return value uh, the same result, two plus two. It only depends on the two numbers that I have. The result is four, and it will always be uh, before. Pure functions in functional languages don't depend on a state. So, again, we can take inspiration from there and avoid to have a state where possible. Uh, comp Anami components like um, the repository, the um, validator, and so on have no state. 
Okay, so you pass an input, it validates your data, it transforms it, and it returns. That is good to go, this, or otherwise it complains because there are some validation problems, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't, um, uh, passing over and over the same input, if it's valid, will be forever valid for the entire lifetime of your uh, application. Have you ever wonder, wondered why caching is hard? Tick, tick, tick because there is state involved, okay? So you have to observe a different um, output because it somehow tied to the, to the state of a cache. Or uh, think ho how the software movement is trying to reject more and more stateless uh, in states. Think of the serverless movement that we have just seen ma with Marion presentation. Uh, you can still get around and have your tasks to, to be accomplished without having a state. With serverless movement, you have function, it's triggered where you send over data and you get back other data, and that's it. You don't have to store something or on that server. And by the same extent, those components, removing the state helps to reduce bugs, because again, it's tied to determinism, and deterministic software means, again, that the for a given input, it returns the always the same output. So it's not pre uh, it's predictable software, and in the end, bugs are just unpredictable behaviors of our of our software. And last thing, where the state is needed, we want it to be immutable. That doesn't mean you cannot assign uh, variables anymore. It doesn't mean that you cannot write to the database. In, that means you cannot mutate Hanami objects to get the job, job done. If you think this is crazy stuff, let's get forget about uh, Hanami for a second. Okay, let's have this uh, uh, this quick Ruby example. I have an array of numbers. I want to calculate a multiplication. I want to multiplicate each number per three. Okay, and we use this array. Um, sorry, this each with object. Uh, uh, method on, on Ruby enumerable, and we do all the calculations. So that returning value, that red uh, variable, is the pa mutable part, is our result. So there is no need to change the numbers array to get our job done. That is the same, the same thing is true for web applications. You get the input, you want to write to the, to the database at the end. That's where the mutation should happen, in your persistent data, not in the objects that sits in between the browser and the database. And immutability guarantee helps to guarantee determinism, which I have seen, again, it's a good value because it you can always observe the same uh, result over and over, and thread safety, which is important because we use web servers that are multi-threaded. Puma, it's a, a standard in our community, and it's multi-threaded by default, and you want to be sure that your software plays well in multi-threading uh, environments. And believe me, it's really hard to hunt bugs in a multi-threading uh, trading um, context so you want to make sure that uh, they never happen at the they cannot happen at all because uh, um, immutability is another concept borrowed by functional uh, from functional program uh, programming uh, languages uh, where mutational state is not allowed just to ease uh, multi threading okay so just to make it clear hami 2.0 components will be immutable and because actions, views, repositories will be immutable, they can be is they will be instantiated only once of the boot of the app, and they will be cached inside a container. Okay, and for each incoming HTTP request, we have only to create the data for the params and the intermediate objects, without the need to instantiate over and over the same view, the same action, and that alleviates a lot the pressure on the Ruby garbage collector because it drastically reduces the amount of objects that are instantiated for a single HTTP request and then has to be thrown away because they have been mutated and they are useless. Uh, 
instance hitting an instance assigning an instance variable inside an action like we do in Rails, like we use it to do in Anami 1.0, in Anami uh, 2.0 will not uh, will no longer be allowed um, as a way to accumulate a result to pass to the to the view. We'll see a, an example in just a second. And this container will hold those references that can be used for later usage. Um, this is an example of, a, of an action, okay? If you see inside this uh, handle uh, implementation, I create a picture. We are still inside the uh, Instagram example. Um, that pictures um, method is a, a repository to write to the database, and then I assign a local variable, and then the two params uh, passed as an argument over there are the request to know the input and the response to use it as we did them before when we did the multiplication example. Okay, it's something that you can mutate, but that is a um, is a, a mutation that doesn't matter in the context of multi-threading to pass data to the view. Okay, so. Re um, Response object is the accumulator that you can use to instantiate your object and pass it to the to the view. In this way, there is no mutation happening to this action. It's instantiated at the boot time and then can be reused over and over. Each for each incoming request, handle is uh, is being called and it does what it needs to do and pass the control over without changing it. With the container feature, this is just a little bit. Uh, easier. Um, before we saw that, sorry, let me get back for a second to the to the previous slide. If this helps, we had that uh, at, um, accessor the picture, and we had to pass that uh, to initialize. This will do that for us by convention. So it saves a few keystrokes, but it's not to save keystrokes. Uh, that will help to mock the database during the test if you want to replace the repository and avoid to hit the, the database. So for all those concepts, I gave uh, last year a talk um, in Moscow. I suggest if you want to know more about uh, the blending of uh, uh, functional programming and OOP programming, there is a uh, talk dedicated to this. So to get back to Hanami 2.0, FP inspiration applied to Ruby leads to better, and now we have a definition of better. That means compatible, single purpose, thread safe, thread safe, maintainable OOP code. We haven't done anything fancy. At the end of the day, we may have been scared, but scared by uh, FP in the slides. But at the end of the day, what we did, we just agreed, and it's a convention to use initialize to accept. Uh, dependencies and call to accept input. There's no rocket science here. It's just a community agreement. It's just a framework, uh, an agreement with the uh, Anami ecosystem. Speaking of which, this is the last part which um, of the talk and it's important for me as well because uh, software in the end is made by people for people and the technology can be perfect or mm, just something to throw away that but the most important part is to be open to the community and build a kind of platform uh, around uh, around this uh, this tool good news are a part of the ruby ecosystem is inspired by those principles too so we decided to team up with uh, rom and dry i don't know if you know those uh, those projects and we have ambitious goals those goals are to unify uh, the projects. That means to remove overlapping gems and to make them fully integrated together. And the uh, goals are to build together an AMI 2.0 based on the other two and at the same time to have ROM 5 and dry, uh, dry RB 1.0. The, the timeline of this would be by the end of the year, and the most important part here is not the timeline, it's not the versioning of those things. It's about 
we are getting together, sharing experience, uh, coding each other features, sharing feedback to have a stronger uh, Ruby ecosystem. And the most important part for me is that we are targeting Ruby ecosystem. Our goal is not to build a wallet garden. As usual, uh, Dryerb, but also Hanami, if you uh, set aside for a second the full web, web stack framework, it's something that ye can be useful for your day-by-day uh, -day job. If you need just a router because you need uh, to quickly build a rack application or if you need uh, an inflection library, you can have a look at dry inflector. It doesn't matter. We are trying to give back to the community so you, as Ruby developers, you can just pull one of those tools and use it alone without marrying the, the entire full stack. Speaking of which, Hanami is the web framework of this uh, Ruby movement. That means dry web is now deprecated and uh, Hanami, because it collects the entire experience of those three projects, is the Ruby framework of this uh, uh, Ruby movement. So everything comes to an end. I uh, choose to not show you uh, too much code, but if you are interested in having a look at uh, how Hanami 2.0 works, there is this demo application under my GitHub profile. It's called Soundeck, so it's GitHub Judasha Soundeck. I will publish those slides, so don't worry about the link. Um, to see, pra in practical terms, what's the result of what I shared with you on today. I guess we have we all have this uh, question in mind. When 2.0 will be released? Again, we had the first alpha in, ge in, the, um, in January, and it will be a second one in, uh, in May. And we uh, don't have a roadmap, fixed roadmap, because this is uh, a lot of work in terms of abstracting the experience of three projects into one. So it takes time that it takes, but we will get there. The only takeaway of this presentation, of this talk, I think the Ruby present is bright because we, this is, I think this is the best ru era for Ruby ever. And the future is exciting because of I believe of the possibilities that Anami can bring to you in your day-by-day -day job. Thank you. <laughs>